Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. Okay, afternoon guys. Um, um, I'm sorry, it's been a bit of a short notice. We've been having um, a few incidents of um, IV gel co-infections. I know it's been a busy week and uh, um, we've been in trouble with a lot of things, um, transition through to the electronic records from paper. Uh, but we need to know that uh, documentation is um, our responsibility. Uh, we need to make sure that um, gel codes, you know, once you insert them, you need to document it. We need to check on the patient. We need to work as a team. Um, the handover should be precise, and uh, we need to check all these factors. Um, we need to bring down um, these incidents. Uh, we can't allow these to happen. Last year, we had a patient died of uh, an infection, so we need to make sure um, that uh, it doesn't happen again. Um, so that's why I called you guys up. Um, let's... Start our day by not killing a patient. How about that? Question 26. Now read the question. During your stay, we will work to keep you as comfortable as possible. Unfortunately, it is unrealistic to feel zero pain after surgery. Our goal is to manage your pain at levels allowing you to participate in physical therapy and other activities. We have many tools to attack pain, starting with the peripheral nerve catheter, or PNC, inserted into your operative leg by the anesthesia team. The PNC delivers numbing medication to surround the nerve that supplies feeling to your hip or knee. We supplement the PNC with other medications as needed, either in pill or IV form. One big help in controlling your pain is to keep your new joint active by moving and working with therapy. Lying in bed too long can result in more pain as the joint grows stiff. In addition to pain medication, you will receive a 10-day supply of Lovenox. Question 27. Now read the question. Mr. Fernandez is a 52-year-old gentleman who was admitted to the ER last night. He lives with his wife, Judy, and was found down at home. They also noted that he had lower extremity swelling for five days and was experiencing some shortness of breath and weakness. When they arrived to the emergency room, he was found to be in atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular rate between the 150s and 160s. After two boluses of diltiazem, he was started on a drip. Uh, he has two peripheral IVs, an 18-gauge in his left hand and an 18-gauge in his left hand. Both were started in the emergency room. Mr. Fernandez is a high fall risk because he fell at home. His bed alarm is on at all times and his call bell is in within reach. Mr. Fernandez, since you fell at home, you're considered a high fall risk, so we need to keep the bed alarm on at all times, okay? Okay. And if you need any assist when you get up, you need assistance, so make sure that you call when you're getting out of bed. I will use this red button on this. Okay, so we can count on you guys to call when you need help, right? I need to go get report on my other patients, so I'll be back in about 20 minutes. But if you need anything, make sure you call, okay? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Sounds great. You're welcome. Question 28. Now read the question.
I've been a nurse for about 11 years now. I started off in cardiac, which I loved, but I was working nights and I wasn't in love with that. And then after that, um, the school where my kids go to school opened up and so I was a school nurse for several years. Um, and during that time, I just felt like I had a lot of kiddos coming to me with um, just a variety of issues that were more behavioral issues such as they were maybe um, harming themselves in some way or maybe having some really big anger issues that they did not really know how to cope with or deal with. And I would try to help them as best as I could and, and get them um, some community support. But I I really felt like I did not have all of the answers that I personally felt like I needed or I felt like I needed a little more training. So I ended up leaving the school and worked full time. Question 29. Now read the question. It is true that athletes are specializing at a younger age than they did a decade or two decades ago. And that does create overuse problems with doing the same repetitive motions year round, which is why we typically recommend for kids, hey, enjoy everything, be involved in everything, do a lot of different things. There will always be sports that one athlete will excel more at than another, but it's still healthy to be a multi-sport athlete and, and use different body parts and different mechanisms. And when you're growing and developing, that has a different impact on your body where you have open growth plates versus when you get older and those growth plates close. And if you're doing the same repetitive activity in a specific area with an open growth plate, you can have a problem there. Question 30. Now read the question. This is one of our mannequins, the Sim Man Essential. He is capable of being a healthy patient. We can also program in variables on him that cause him to be unhealthy patient as well because as we know, most of our patient population these days aren't your typical healthy patient. So when we bring the students into the room for the simulation, they are able to do an assessment of listening to heart and lungs on our mannequin. They can do a neurological evaluation of his eyes as well. Shortly thereafter then, we go ahead and start the anesthetic procedure. So we start by giving him some oxygen by the mask. Obviously, he's still awake at this point in time. And then the students are expected to start the drug um, administration. And I am on a computer in a different room able to program the drugs that the students are giving. And then the mannequin responds to the drugs by either you know, going to sleep or getting sleepy. Um, so that the students then can carry on the procedure that has been outlined for them. What's neat about these mannequins, we can mass ventilate them, we can put special airway devices in like an endotracheal tube. If they don't happen to get the endotracheal tube in the right spot, he has a blue light that will light up in his mouth to show them the patient is not getting enough oxygen. I'm on the control and I can make the heart rate and the blood pressure change parameters as well. Um, so it, it's a learning experience for them so they can identify maybe they didn't put the endotracheal tube in the right place. He also has IV access, so we can do IV practice on him. We can give the drugs through the IV. That's typically how you do it in the anesthesia. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. 
Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. It is important to realise that 83% of people who commit suicide or attempt suicide have had contact with a doctor within a year of their death, and up to 66% of people who commit or attempt suicide have had such contact within a month of their death. Therefore, with better prevention techniques, these figures could be reduced. We can divide suicide prevention into three categories, which are primary, secondary or tertiary. Secondary suicide prevention aims to decrease the likelihood of a suicide attempt in high-risk patients. Tertiary suicide prevention occurs in response to completed suicides and attempts to, to diminish suicide in a particular geographical area or in a particular age group. I would now like to look at secondary suicide prevention in more detail. Secondary suicide prevention is particularly important, but not always given the attention that it deserves, in part because research into secondary prevention is only just starting to be applied to clinical practice. Now, from a clinical perspective, suicide is often difficult to predict due to its complex nature. The three major risk factors that contribute to suicidal behaviour are biological, psychological and proximal stresses, which are recent events that can lead to increased suicide risk. Firstly, there are biological risk factors for suicide, which include low blood cholesterol levels, medical or neurological illnesses such as multiple sclerosis, stroke, Huntington disease and epilepsy, cigarette smoking. Secondly, there are psychological risk factors which include a childhood history of physical or sexual abuse, aggressive personality traits, low self-esteem, and poor access to psychiatric treatment. Thirdly, there are proximal stresses or the recent events that can lead to increased suicide risk, and these include relationship problems with a spouse, partner, or loved one, financial troubles caused by unemployment or large amounts of debt, a family history of suicide, major depression and drug abuse. The clinical evaluation of the medical and psychiatric history of a patient and of their current state is the crucial and essential element of the suicide assessment process. It is important because it enables the identification of risk factors in order to determine the patient's immediate safety and the best setting for treatment, and also to develop diagnosis and treatment strategies. Psychiatric illness is a major contributing factor to suicide risk, with mood disorders such as major depressive disorder 
and bipolar disorder being associated with about 60% of suicides. Indeed, psychiatric disorders are diagnosed in more than 90% of completed suicides, and more than 80% of these psychiatric disorders are untreated. Thus, the recognition and treatment of individuals with psychiatric disorders, specifically mood disorders, are essential components of secondary suicide prevention. In addition, the subjective rating of the severity of depression is one of the most powerful predictors of future suicidal acts. Therefore, assessing and managing depression, as well as being aware of the suicide risks in psychologically, medically and neurologically disordered individuals, is an important aspect of secondary suicide prevention. Consequently, physicians need to be taught to recognise the association between mental disorders and suicide. Additional information about the individual who may be at risk for suicide, such as medical and psychiatric treatment records and toxicology screenings, should also be incorporated into the assessment. Equally importantly, clinicians and other professionals in a position to offer help should not hesitate to ask patients about suicidal ideation because, while it may seem surprising, patients will often talk frankly about their suicidal thoughts and tendencies if given the opportunity. Failure to ask about suicidal ideation may be related to the health professional's discomfort with the topic, lack of time or lack of skills in this area. Clinicians need to overcome these obstacles to provide appropriate care to their patients. What are the most effective secondary suicide prevention strategies? In a recent systematic review of suicide prevention strategies, Mann, along with other researchers, found evidence of effectiveness in five secondary suicide prevention methods, including pharmacological interventions, psychological interventions, follow-up care, reduced access to lethal means, and responsible media reporting of suicide. Antidepressant medications are the most widely used pharmacological interventions in secondary suicide prevention, but studies of their effectiveness in reducing suicide attempts have had mixed results. Among adults younger than 25, the effect of antidepressants seems to be neutral on suicidal behaviour, but it seems to reduce the risk of suicidal behaviour in the elderly. Thus, the relation between antidepressants and suicide needs further studies before this class of drugs can be safely used for the secondary prevention of suicide. In terms of psychological interventions, suicidal patients often benefit from therapies that address the repetition of suicidal thoughts and behaviours and other factors commonly associated with suicide. Better psychological and pharmacological treatment of depression and alcoholism also appears to decrease suicide rates. Social factors that should be addressed in follow-up treatment include availability and willingness of supports within the family. Support individuals who should be contacted about the suicide risk and follow-up arrangements include general practitioners, private psychiatrists, family and friends. Some interventions, however, such as telephone and psychosocial follow-up, have shown no difference in suicidal ideation when compared with standard aftercare. Many studies show that suicides by particular methods, for example, firearms, domestic gas or pesticides, decrease after the introduction of legal restrictions that reduce access to such means. This reduction in suicide rates is particularly influential in regions where the specific means of restriction correlates with a common method of suicide. For example, in the UK, the reduction of carbon monoxide in domestic gas since 1958 and the reduced availability of analgesics since the mid-1990s have both decreased UK suicide rates. Finally, many studies have exposed a need for a decrease in reporting of suicide and for responsible reporting. Media blackouts in reporting suicide have coincided with a decrease in suicide rates because reports of suicide in the media tend to glamorise suicide for vulnerable individuals. 
The internet is also of increasing concern, with blogs and chat rooms providing accessible instructions for suicide. For these reasons, guidelines have recently been produced for the responsible reporting of suicide. Despite our increasing knowledge about secondary suicide prevention, there are still many gaps in the research, and looking to the future, thorough evaluations and appropriate treatments of patients with depressive disorders and other psychiatric illnesses should help to improve the efficacy of secondary prevention of suicide. But it is also clear that more research into new approaches for the prevention and treatment of suicidal behaviour remains essential. Now look at Extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. New research from the Perkins Institute at the University of Sydney claims to have found the diet that boosts FGF21 levels. One of the lead scientists on the study was Samantha Solombiat of the Perkins. Welcome to the Health Report. Thank you for having me. So what is this stuff, FGF21? I mean, it's almost eye-crossingly complicated from the look of it. Yeah, it seems complicated, but it's actually not. And Recently, there's actually been an immense amount of interest in fibroblast growth factor 21 or FGF21. And this hormone has actually recently been called this fountain of youth hormone, which we know can be influenced by diet. And the reason why FGF21 is so interesting is because high levels of this miracle hormone, as it's called, has actually been shown to play a huge role in influencing appetite, um, improving metabolic health and immunity, and even extending lifespan in mice. Now, something that sounds so good to be true is usually too good to be true. At this point, there are no adverse effects shown with increased levels of FGF21. In fact, a lot of studies are now being done to investigate FGF21 as a therapeutic target for the treatment of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Let's just double back, uh, Sam. A year or so ago, we had Steve Simpson, who's the director of the Perkins Institute, talking about this 25 diet study where they start, started 25, you started 25 diets in mice to see if you could replicate the life-prolonging effects of a low-calorie diet. We are extremely low-calorie diets in some animal species. In fact, all animal species, it seems, apart from humans, because it's not been proven yet, increases life expectancy or lifespan. Is the FGF21 really the heart of this matter? We think it actually could be. Certainly in this study, we've shown that a diet low in protein and high in carbohydrate is the most effective way to increase levels of this miracle hormone. And that this diet was also associated with several markers of improved metabolic health in mice. So tell us a little bit about this study. 
Well, what we actually did was performed a really large mouse study, as you said, where we took 858 mice and offered them a range of different diets to see how macronutrients such as proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, as well as total energy, could interact and influence levels of FGF21. And you found? And we found exactly that, that we could use diet to increase the levels of this FGF21 hormone and that a low-protein, high-carbohydrate diet was the most effective way for increasing this miracle hormone. And what effect did that miracle hormone, I hate using that word, that <laughs> phrase, but who, what effect then did the hormone have on these mice, or were you able to separate the two? We were actually able to show that the exact diet that increased FGF21 also improved things like insulin sensitivity, glucose tolerance, blood pressure, and blood lipids even though the animals were a little bit fatter. And how do you know that was anything to, whatsoever to do with the FGF21, your so-called miracle hormone, and uh, rather than it just being an accident, that it was raised too? What we did was plotted FGF21 using the geometric framework, which is a nutritional modelling platform that helps us tease apart the role of nutrients and calories. And if you line up all the, the surfaces, the response surfaces, in this framework with FGF21 and all the metabolic outcomes, you can clearly see that there's a specific area in the nutrient space that coincides with increased levels of FGF21 and several metabolic benefits. And what kind of carbohydrate and what happened about f with fats? In this study, fat did not appear to have an effect on FGF21 levels. It seemed to be low protein was the primary driver and that the highest combination was with a low-protein, high-carbohydrate diet. So what does FGF21 do to the body? And that's a really good question, and that's really the next step of our study. We want to understand how FGF21 signaling works in response to diet to mediate all these beneficial outcomes. Do we know that were there are any medications affected? At this point, no. It, it seems that it, you know, it goes up with starvation, it goes up with overfeeding, there's lots of things that influence it. Did the appetite of these mice change? Do they eat more or less when the FGF21 goes up? Oh, that's a really good question. See, this is one of the things that we were able to reconcile in our studies. As you mentioned, a whole range of literature in previous studies have shown that FGF21 is elevated in many paradoxical conditions such as starvation and obesity, high intake of food and low intake of food, as well as in insulin resistance and in insulin sensitivity. So what is going on here? Using the geometric framework, we were actually able to tease apart these findings, showing that uh, reduced protein intake is the primary driver of FGF21. Okay, so what happens in mice does not necessarily happen in humans. Um, how do you know it makes any difference at all in humans? Oh, I'm glad you said that. We've actually published work just this year showing that FGF21 levels in humans is also increased by a low-protein, high-carbohydrate diet. And of course, this is really exciting because it tells us that the work that we do in mice can be directly translatable to humans. So is there any evidence at all that FGF21 has the same beneficial metabolic effects in humans as it has in mice? Yes, there is definitely evidence to suggest that high FGF21 levels is directly related and associated with several benefits of metabolic health in humans as well. So we should put it in the drinking water then, do we? Yeah, we? probably. That seems to be the case, yes. How would it work? I mean, obviously, a hormone like this is probably destroyed in the stomach. You, this is not something that you would give directly to people, I assume, in the therapeutic context? At the moment, it's difficult to do chronic administration to humans. So what's happening in terms of drug development is trying to develop uh, mimetics of FGF21 and analogs, so not exactly administering this hormone per se, because it would require chronic injections or chronic administration. So almost nothing that's touted as a breakthrough or a miracle by scientists turns out to be so. What are your modest expectations of FGF21 in humans? Well, in humans, we actually think that FGF21 is extremely promising. We think that, at least in humans, we've shown that FGF21... So a treatment for type 2 diabetes? Absolutely. That sort of thing? Yes. We've shown that humans seem to respond in the same way as mice. So this could mean that we could tailor our diets and our nutritional guidelines to generate a range of benefits from FGF21. 
Is it too blunderbuss? Is, if you're describing something that sounds blunderbuss rather than targeted. You're just spraying an effect rather than targeting an effect. You know, if you can do anything with it, it's going to be a very wide set of actions which you're going to find hard to control, isn't it? At the moment, everyone is very interested at FGF21, but no one really knows its mechanism of action. And it seems to be a race at the moment. How does it work? What turns it on? What switches it off? And what can we do to find out more about it? So at this point, I think it's um, a really hot topic and everyone's racing to find out the answer. And you hope you'll be first. Hopefully. Sam, thanks for joining us on The Health Report. Thank you so much. Samantha solon is a researcher at the Perkins Institute at the University of Sydney. And on our website, we'll have a link to our previous interview on the Diet and Longevity Study. 